In word, nor with the tongue, but in deed and in truth. Words taken from our epistle today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This Sunday falls in between the Feast of Corpus Christi and the Feast of the Sacred Heart. So today we shall consider how devotion to the Sacred Heart helps our devotion to the Holy Eucharist. You can see for yourselves, but it seems to me that one of the principal reasons, probably the principal reason, why people attend the traditional Latin Mass is the reverence shown the Blessed Sacrament. Most everyone has witnessed acts of disrespect, of outright sacrilege, against the Blessed Sacrament, widespread in so many churches, so much so that many people there seem to take no notice of it at all. But for those who love the Most Holy Eucharist, it is painful to attend such churches, to see people dressed casually, immodestly, receiving Holy Communion in their hands distractedly, carrying on about in church as if they were at a picnic. Our Lord Jesus Christ has given to his faithful, in, has given to his faithful the greatest gift that he could possibly give. For he cannot give anything more than all of himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Thus we are rightly horrified at the abuse and mistreatment shown to such a gift. And we are right to seek out an oasis where reverence for the Blessed Sacrament reigns supreme, where we may pay appropriate honor and respect to our Lord. What kind of love should we have for the Eucharist? Reverence for a gift or devotion to a friend? Friendship finds or makes friends like each other. We say we love the Eucharist. Can we be friends with the Eucharist? Can we be like the Eucharist? We might say we love the Grand Canyon but we cannot become like it. We love the Grand Canyon in awe at its magnitude and beauty. We appreciate it lovingly, but it remains out there. Friendship makes the lover like what he loves. It does not love something merely outside, but draws what is loved into the heart. Our Lord does not wish us to merely reverence him as a king high upon his throne over the whole world, untouchable in his greatness. Rather, our good Lord most wishes us to love him as a friend, for friends share one heart with each other. Friendship is not loving someone wonderful out there who stays out there, but rather sharing the same heart. If we wish to increase our devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, then, can there be any better way than by cultivating devotion to the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ? Is this not what he means when he tells us, Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Is there any other way? that we can become more like our Lord, that we can imitate him better? Can we imitate his preaching with authority? His miracles, where the most powerful forces of nature are subject to his slightest command? In some way, yes, we can imitate his suffering, but how many are called to martyrdom? Friendship makes our heart like the heart of whom we love. We love the Grand Canyon because it is magnificent, but this is not friendship. We are not friends with the Grand Canyon. It doesn't make our heart magnificent. We love chocolate because it tastes good, but we cannot be friends with chocolate. It will not turn our heart into chocolate. 
But when we love a friend, we love what he loves and hate what he hates and are hurt by what hurts him. Perfect friendship is indeed sharing a heart because it is to share all the same loves and pains as our friend. This, then, this simple friendship, is what our Lord asks of us when he seeks our devotion to his sacred heart. It begins, of course, with obedience to his commandments, avoiding sin, avoiding doing anything displeasing to our Lord, for clearly you cannot be friends with Christ if you serve his enemy. But it is more than this. The good servant obeys his master, but there is more to friendship than obedience. Friends share the same sorrows. Thus we should be pained by whatever pains our Lord's sacred heart. Pope Pius XI writes, When Christ manifested himself to Margaret Mary and declared to her the infinitude of his love, at the same time in the manner of a mourner, he complained that so many and such great injuries were done to him by ungrateful men. And we would that these words in which he made this complaint were fixed in the minds of the faithful and were never blotted out by oblivion. Behold this heart, he said, which has loved men so much and has loaded them with all benefits and for this boundless love has had no return but neglect and contempt. And this often from those who are bound by a debt and duty of a more special love. Just the same can any soul who loves the Blessed Sacrament remain indifferent to the irreverence so often shown it. We would also do well to ask ourselves, we who are given the great gift and privilege of being able to go to the traditional Mass, are we not then bound by a debt and duty to a more special love. When we see one we love suffering, we not only feel the same sorrow in our hearts, but wish to do all we can to alleviate that suffering if we cannot remove it entirely. Devotion to the Sacred Heart is more than just emotional sympathy with our Lord. It must include reparation as well. Pius XI reminds us that just as Christ was sorrowful unto death in the garden because of seeing all the sins men were to commit, he also derived somewhat of solace from our reparation, which was likewise foreseen. So now, in a wondrous yet true manner, we can and ought to console that most sacred heart which is continually wounded by the sins of thankless men. He concludes, If anyone will lovingly dwell on these things of which we have been speaking, and will have them deeply fixed in his mind, it cannot be but he will shrink with horror from all sin as from the greatest evil. And more than this, he will yield himself wholly to the will of God, and it will strive to repair the injured honor of the divine majesty, as well as by constantly praying as by voluntary mortifications, by patiently bearing the afflictions that befall him, and lastly, by spending his whole life in this exercise of expiation. Cannot all of this be said just as equally with regard to the Eucharist? Are you outraged by the sacrilegious communions made by pro-choice politicians, the sacrilegious treatment which occurs in so many churches? Pius XI again says, Whosoever of the faithful have piously pondered on all these things must need be inflamed with the charity of Christ in his agony and make a more vehement endeavor to expiate their own faults and those of others, 
to repair the honor of Christ and to promote the eternal salvation of souls. But what are we doing to repair this damage? You see the politicians receiving communion or these other things. What good does shaking our fist at that do? Shake harder, boy. Nothing. How does that repair the damage? How does anger and outrage fix anything? Is it enough, then, to do the minimum of fasting and mortification that the church commands? Or when sin abounds, must grace not ever more abound? Shall we consecrate ourselves to the sacred heart in our lips and emotions? Or should we make some extra sacrifice regularly in atonement? All of our Lord's sufferings he bore on behalf of the sins of others, the sins of those who even at the time were unrepentant, so that by virtue of his sacrifice they might have the grace to repent. When we act likewise and practice extra mortification in atonement, then we imitate our Lord and unite not just our emotions, but our actions to his. And in doing so, we love our neighbor by suffering for love of his soul. The Roman Catechism says that a very necessary preparation to receive Holy Communion is to ask ourselves if we are at peace with and sincerely love our neighbor. Just so, if we wish to have friendship with our Lord's sacred heart, we must strive to cultivate within us a love for the sinner, an eagerness for his conversion, and a desire to pour out forgiveness upon him. Finally, we shall make our hearts most like our Lord's when we strive to banish from them all pride and anger. Our good Lord says, Learn from me. Imitate me. Imitate me in the way that everyone is capable of doing. In your heart, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. How many times... Are we faced with some little thing which spurs in us pride or anger? Someone doesn't give us the credit we think is due or takes some trivial thing we had our eye on, our heart set on. And all of a sudden there rises up within us this burning thorn, trying to get out. We want to spit out that curt remark, get it out of us, feel that relief. But these instances are equally an opportunity to turn our hearts and make them like Christ's, which comes at a cost. We feel pain in the heart when we repress that pride or anger. It sticks in our heart like a burning thorn. True devotion to the Sacred Heart is in bearing with these thorns that burn in our hearts. It is to be wounded at the heart just like Christ. It is to love with Christ, to hate sin with Christ, to sorrow with Christ, to rejoice over converted sinners with him, to make a sacrifice of our bodies, and to wound our self-love at its very deepest center. Thus, friendship with Christ comes at a cost. We must suffer our hearts to be made meek and humble. Christ promises that if we do so, we shall find rest for our souls. Not that we shall be free from violent temptations or from opposition, but that our hearts will rest in his, like resting in like. 
sharing the same love, sorrow, and joy. And the more we practice this, the more you make your heart like Christ's, the more your soul is at rest, and the better a holy communion you shall make, the longer the effects of this communion will stay in you, more and more until it is Christ's heart which beats in you more than your own, until Christ dwells in your heart not just for one hour, but all days, even to the consummation of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for listening. Please remember to click subscribe and to hit the bell for notifications. And in this age of censorship, please consider helping support us at sensefidelium.com. Under the Donate and Support tab, there are plenty of ways to help support the work and to help grow and sustain the efforts of Census Fidelium in general. May God reward you, and thank you very much.